Welcome, Ebony. I'm so delighted to have you here on the Brand Up Podcast. Thank you for agreeing to be my guest. I'm so excited about talking about these things because I think this stuff is like here and I probably know all the, the things, but I probably also don't know that I know. So I'm actually really excited to have this conversation with you. Mm, and the stuff that you are talking about is mm. the idea of brand and of how you have evolved as a business and how you've put yourself out into the world. So the reason I asked for, for you who are listening, the reason that I asked Ebony to join us is because in the 10 years that I've been in this online space, avidly learning and soaking in lots of knowledge and connecting with beautiful people like Ebony, I have watched Ebony evolve from leading a community that was called for misfit it was the misfits community right for, and you yeah, were talking misfits maven is still the journey but i was very much focused on on from a to r and taking misfits to become maven yeah 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 so mm -hmm. that was the first season that i met you in and mm -hmm. then over the time of the the last decade really i've watched you be this incredible leader and have this beautiful community and say things that felt brave and be a beacon to people who maybe have felt misunderstood or like they somehow didn't fit and didn't really understand why, which is something that I related to without understanding why at the time. And we've had a conversation since on your Sacrosanct Life podcast about that. Um, so I'll, I'll um, list that in the show notes, link to that in the show notes. But it's been really interesting to watch you, fascinating really, to see how you've taken your brand of the work that you do and evolved it over time. And it's been like watching you be the caterpillar that transforms into the chrysalis that comes into this beautiful butterfly that then becomes a caterpillar again and transforms into a chrysalis and then becomes this butterfly. And, and the journey has been so beautiful to watch. So I would love you to take us through that journey. But before we do, the question that I love to ask at the beginning of every Brand Up podcast is what does brand mean to you in the context of your business? And do you think about it? Brand for me is the cohesiveness, the energy, the message that you're sharing, the thing that makes you you, the thing that makes you separate from everybody else. Like it's this identity piece. It's the, very much the identity of the business and the message. Um, yeah, I think that's what branding has, has meant to me. And that has been on a visual level. It has been on a voice level or a copy or, you know, the words that come through level. Um, and then also on a colors, <laughs> like, like all of it, like it's very sensorial for me. It's been around the photographs that I've used, the archetypes that I'm sharing, like this whole kind of world that I want you to know exists about, because, because I'm taking you on a journey and it is a whole world and a whole sense and a whole experience. So that's, yeah, that's what I think about when I'm thinking about branding. And way 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 back at the beginning of my journey i did one of those exercises where someone said to me if you could sum your brand up in three words what would it be and my three words were walks her talk mm. and i realized that that's not what they meant <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, so sd but um i believe that that is what is at the essence of my brand and i hope that that comes across I would say yes, having watched you evolve and go through that process over and over in the last decade, for sure. You do come across really as someone who has a degree of authenticity and courage in that authenticity to share it. And that is, it's arresting. It really is and has been to watch you. So can you share with us back in the day when you were leading what at the time was the main part of the business was the Misfit yeah. to, from Misfit to Maven. Can you talk to us a little bit about what that business was and how how you evolved? Because there, there came a point in your journey where it got quite sticky. And I remember you sharing on Facebook about how you weren't sure that you felt that you, you felt somehow that it was okay or that you were allowed to share this new artistic iteration of yourself. So let's go back to the beginning, the Misfit mm -hmm. to Maven part. You know what, for me, like I need to go like just a little bit further back than that. So before Misfit to Maven, my business and brand was the Entrepreneur Enabler. 
And as I moved into writing my book, and the book was published in 2014, so it has been nine years since that book came out. And I wrote it a year and a half before then, uh, and then sat on it in a little while because of my parents' um, reaction or response to the book, and I wasn't sure whether I was going to publish it. And and so that the relationship with edginess and courage and authenticity and voice like really started with the with the publication of From Misfit to Maven, and. Before that, I was the entrepreneur enabler. And in my mind, there was a level of professionalism and mask and, uh, I don't know, corporate identity, like this, this kind of thing I needed to squish myself into in order to be perceived as professional or, or in order to be perceived as knowing my stuff or being worth employing you know that kind of thing and so the one of the battles or one of the timelines that's run through this journey for me has been my relationship with what it means to be professional and which bits you show and which bits you don't and one of the core themes that I have come to understand in my human design, which is a really big part of this journey for me, but one of the core themes in my work is intimacy. And I didn't really know that at the beginning. And so there was this battle between professionalism and intimacy and can mm-hmm. those two meet and what does that look like? Yeah. And so at that point, I you know, believed I wanted to be a thought leader and I thought I really wanted to be an influencer and have impact and be seen as the authority on something, whilst at the same time wanting to create a community and a container and a space that felt homely and safe and intimate. Mm. And so the messages and the identity and there was sorry there was one other piece I remember watching Derek Halpin who I adored at the time because he was a um a shouty New Yorker and uh, would talk quite a lot about brand identity and he would say something like figure out kind of who you are and then as if it were a caricature like turn it up right and he was like I'm not this shout shouty and I'm not this New Yorker in real life um, you must kind of, you know, find the thing that is you and then turn the volume up on that. And so the thing that I turned the volume up on back then was this like sassy, tattooed, different person, but with this kind of soft edge. And then my relationship with my softness, that has really changed because I never really liked the vulnerable part of me. I never really wanted anyone to see me as as soft or feminine or, you know, and I didn't see myself as feminine. I actually saw myself as very masculine and direct and concise and quite brash. And I think that's one of the threads that has shifted over the last 10 years. Hmm. Interesting on so many levels that you're talking about masking, because in the conversation that you and I had on your podcast, we were talking Mm -hmm. about my diagnosis of ADHD and yours and the journey that you've been on around your different neurodivergences and how much masking really is a part of that experience of Mm -hmm. having a sense our whole lives that there's something that is just not quite right. I'm using giant inverted commas here. Um, about the way that we think or we do or we behave or whatever. Pick a thing. There's something just not quite, just not a little off. And as a result of having those characteristics or traits, we learn to mask, which means to hide and to pretend. And so when you describe that corporate shell, that, you know, that being a thought leader, the first thing that came to my mind in addition to masking was, wow, being a thought leader is all in your head. And what you are is an embodied, sensual leader and and goddess, really, the way that I see you now. And I remember, I, I didn't meet you pre for Misfit to Maven, but I remember feeling this like, this, this really solid, grounded, um, warrior woman for the for the misunderstood and the misfits in in the business world and it's really interesting that there was that 
dual mask of needing to have that corporate professionalism to be respectable or respected, but also to have that really strong masculine presentation in addition to also having this, I'm fine. Everything's fine. I do all the things like all the other people. When in fact, that's not, that's not your reality. And thank God that you now bring to your work the full range of what you are, because I still see in you that strength and that goddess and that warrior aspect and that leadership and the striding confidently with people, you know, following behind you who might need to borrow a little bit of your confidence to, to, you know, step into the next iteration of themselves. I still see that in you and the beauty of what you create with your art and the beauty of how you present yourself and you, you, you've bloomed into the world exists at the same time. Thanks. <laughs> I think that there was a part of me, as you were talking, I was like, oh, that's really interesting. Like I, I really lent on, like if we're talking brand, there was an element of ad- advocacy at mm-hmm. the beginning. Like there was really this sense of like, be strong. You've got this like competency, confidence, like warrior, very warrior. Um, and I have a system that I call the value filter system or your compass. And that has evolved from being quite a head led uh, concept very much into an incredibly embodied concept and, and a way of working with interoception, which really helps those of us who may not um, experience the world in the same way as other people or experience emotion or physical sensation or, or all of those interoceptive parts in the same way. And I'm learning now actually how big a deal this tiny piece of work that I thought was just a minor part of what I did is, is now grown in this. And one of the energies in my masculine is, is truth or duty. And I, That's what I was leading with then. And over the years, the other side of that, my um, dynamic feminine, if you like, is magic. And this kind of soft, playful, it gets to be fun. You know, healing doesn't have to be heavy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like you get to laugh at yourself because actually like human, being human is ridiculous. And (laughs) that part has crept into my work and I if you'd said to me 10 years ago you're going to be leaning on playful ridiculous uh funny sexy in your work I would have been like but I'll die (laughs) like who's gonna pay me for that yeah um and to hear you say that I was embodied even then is really interesting because I was in so many ways disconnected from and felt shameful around my body for Mm -hmm. all the reasons a lot of them very patriarchal very um mainstream very societal you know in terms of that but also because I didn't connect in with whole parts of my with whole parts of myself and this journey has really been about further embodiment and not just embodying the parts of myself that keep me and others safe but actually embodying the parts of myself that are light, that allow me to receive, that center me in my world rather than everybody else all of the time. Mm -hmm. And that shift has led to this expansion. You know, the idea that I had a whole range at the beginning was terrifying. And one of the things that I heard a lot about branding way back when was simplify your message, simplify your message, simplify your message. You must have one thing. Mm -hmm. And as a manifesting generator and an odd HD and a huge range woman, that was like, I, I didn't know what to do with that. And so one of the things that has grown over the last 10 years is a, is, is a complexity actually to my brand, which I didn't think I was allowed then. Because that's what we're told to Mm. keep it simple and clear. And in fact, when you said that you had been, you had been, it had been recommended to you to choose three words to describe your brand. I I audibly, like I felt my body go, (gasps) because choosing for this manifesting generator ADHD or with, you know, massive, emotive range and sensitivity and all the things is one of the most difficult things to do to what you want me to reduce my options. You want me to, you want me to ignore the complexity. You want me to just, just three, it's impossible. And in a way I find that when I'm working with my clients, it's actually a beautiful exercise to 
curate and collect and curate, which is different, has a different feeling to me around values and around messages and around language choices Mm. and characteristics of the brand. It's a very different feeling to pick three words, right? It's hang on, let's, let's collect it all together. Let's look at the beautiful complexity. Let's understand the, the fullness of the range. Okay. And how can we then take that and package it in such a way, create an offering that allows the people on the other side who, who need our work to receive it like the thimble of water that they can maybe handle now instead of a tsunami wave that's just going to drown them and it'll be over. Mm. So you're talking about how in the beginning you had these set notions of what was acceptable or permissible within the idea of of your brand and how you expressed yourself in the work that you did. And you mentioned that when you had written the book, you held it for a while because of the response that your, your parents had to what was within. It seems that, I wonder if there's a parallel between that moment and the moment where you had been leading the For Misfit to Maven community and you had been this, this personage online, you know, who had these qualities and characteristics there came a moment where you seemed to step off that path in a very complete way and say, this is no longer what I am doing. I am an artist. I will be creating my art. If you're interested, here it is. Otherwise, I'm stepping off this treadmill. Mm. Is there a parallel between those two times? And can you talk to us about what, what that moment was like? Because you've upheld this mask, this shell, this presentation for such a long time, which is, which is a true presentation Mm. of parts of what you were at the time. Mm. And now you're saying, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm taking that shell off. I'm just going to walk away. I'm going to paint. So there's a couple of different things here. The book and permission and my parents and all of that was definitely a piece around visibility and Mm. safety and what is acceptable to share and and those things um where the business went was how I believed what like I think the unsaid thing in all of this was that I believed there was something I didn't know that would make me successful (laughs) but I believe that there was a secret source some kind of framework some kind of golden or red thread that if I followed it hang on hang on one sec Ebony I lost you you completely froze you said I believed that there was something I was missing can you just say that again there was something I believe there was something I was missing that would make me successful and then say whatever else you comes after that I, like some kind of red thread or golden thread, there was something that I was missing, some kind of secret source that if I discovered it, if I paid someone enough money, if I picked the right person out there, that they would give me this missing piece of information. And that I was essentially about contorting myself in a certain way. And if I wanted not only to be successful, if I wanted more time to myself if I wanted to be able to play that was possible after I had achieved the hard stuff Mm. and there was a you know that there was a framework that there was some kind of system that I wasn't understanding or getting and if I look at that now through the lens of experience and neurodiversity it's like well of course you believe that that was the framework of your life right like in order to get school I need to understand the rules then game it in order to get relationship I need to understand the rules and then game it I truly believed that I in order to be successful in business I needed to understand the rules and then game it and part of my journey of that was growing the business that then became Misfit for Life I had three friends that I brought in and they became business partners People tell you never to do that. There's a reason for that. But PDA, well, I will not listen. I have to do it myself. Mm-hmm. I'm a run next to a swimming pool kind of a person. And I genuinely <laughs> believed that it would, ma- you know, it would be great. We'd been friends for 10 years. I really thought that this was going to allow us to move into 
And again, this came from an altruistic place of duty and good and responsible for the world. Mm -hmm. I believed that if I used this framework to expand, I would have a greater impact on the world. I'd be able to help more people. What I lost was me. Why Mm -hmm. was I doing this for me? (laughs) Other than to like put food on the table, keep myself in in crystals. (laughs) Like Mm -hmm. what, what it had to be about me. And the company folded, they left. Um, I don't want to go into details that are kind of irrelevant in this, this story, but that was the end of the company. It happened very quickly. And I lost my company and my three best friends overnight. Oh, Ebony. And that sent me into a place of what is actually important here. Mm. And what And I call it my tower card moment because sometimes the universe is like, hey, hey, you're really running in the wrong direction. I'm going to have to pull it all down so that you Mm -hmm. stop and take stock and like rebuild from the rubble, but using the pieces that are important and that matter. Mm. And I realized that underneath it all, I am not a businesswoman. I am not an entrepreneur. What I am is an artist using my business as a vehicle for entrepreneurialism and to help others. But first and foremost, it is about me expressing myself. And if that lands with other people, and if that's helpful to other people, that's a a byproduct, but that actually I'm here to express and learn and express. And, And then as a manifesting generator, and this was all kind of came in around the same time, actually I'm here to synthesize and iterate and make things more efficient and more fun and more magnetic and more playful for people and so that transition that you were talking about came from two places came from complete and utter having the life and wind you know like being winded like properly being hit by life and being like I I have nothing left I cannot operate I need to tend to my wounds for a little while but what I can do is share my art because that's how I express. And I, I did two things. I, I painted and I shared for the first time ever. I, like I had been painting for years, but I'd never shared. I never wanted anyone to pay me for my art. It, it was mine and I didn't want to share it for the world. And I also made a private podcast at the time called Tales of Alchemy. And that ran for a year while I talked through, uh, verbally processed out loud, like what was going on for me and, and let people pay for that. And they did. And that fundamentally changed what I believed was possible in my business and brand. Mm. And before the end of the company, I had really decided that I was going to step into, a lot of my work had been about archetypes and I was going to step into majesty, right? I'd been in Maiden at the beginning of my business and then Misfit to Maven when I had this community, I was in mother and I had a lot of kids I was looking after and I Mm -hmm. treated them that way and I allowed them to put me on a pedestal and that was not great. And and, and I moved and I knew it was time to step into majesty and I knew I was ready to receive and I didn't know that in order to receive... (laughs) I was going to have to let go of a lot of control and not be necessarily in control of what I was receiving. Mm. And so the last 18 months, it's probably two years now, I think it's nearer two years, has been a process of really stepping into majesty and allowing myself to receive and be like, well, what is what is my what is my business? What is my vehicle? What does it look like if I no longer do the things that I think that I should but I just do the things that I want to do that feels daring and also I wonder how much of that is informed by what you have learned through experience at every phase of your evolution and as you've been learning from different professionals in marketing and in business design and structure and all of the things, all of the, all of the sources of you should be doing all of this and like well-intentioned and, and super useful, right? I wonder how much of this ability to unfurl is based on, I'm unfurling as an expressor having put in place these pillars of business, having in place these structures, having in place, because 
for anyone who's listening who might not be familiar with human design, well, maybe I'll just pin the idea of explaining what a manifesting generator is, and I'll let you do that far better than me. <laughs> but in order to to have that that floatiness and the whimsical and the play, etc., on its own, it can be a bit of a car crash. But when it's underpinned by the solidity of what you have built as a reputation over the years, even though the way you've shown up has evolved, I think it's your very evolution that has meant that people who align with you and your values and, and the way that you're growing, it's been a way for them to actually buy into you through the journey. Mm. How much would you say that the, the freedom that you have to express your manifesting or to follow, follow the bliss of your man and your inner manifesting generator is supported by more brain-based knowledge, data systems, processes, learnings. I feel like I need to answer this in a, in a slightly different way, but the mm. way is like yeah, that nothing happens immediately and we get to trust the timing of our lives. And for me, everything is built on what came before. And so in terms of answering the question, if I had shown up as a floaty, playful uh, manifesting generator right at the beginning, um, would any of the structures have got built? I don't know. Would would it have worked? Probably not, right? And it is an influ it is those two things. And I actually believe we really have to heal and work with our masculine, our inner masculine first in order to feel safe, in order to have those structures and in, in order to create pr protection. And it's not that we it's not that we're dividing ourselves out into kind of masculine energy and, and feminine energy, but much more layering them on top of each other. We have to create a container that we can then express or or be free or creative in. We need both of those things together for sure. And I needed to create a certain level of safety and structure and routine and discipline before I could really lean into devotion. Whether it's always that way around, I don't know. I think for some people, they lean into the creativity and the artistry and the devotion and the feminine first, and then they realize that they need to confine to some containment. Otherwise, they're not, people are going to think they're flaky, right? Like there's, there is a level of both that is needed for each person. So I don't know if that answers the question, but it's it's definitely both for me. And I And I haven't being a manifesting generator doesn't mean just being floaty and being an artist doesn't just mean being floaty, but it does mean like for me, again, it's opening up the systems. Three was not enough. I now work with fives. Five is enough <laughs> and works with me. And I, I kind of have these, yeah, there's, there's very often a structure of five within my business. And that does give me some containment because otherwise I can follow a butterfly down a tangent and get lost for two weeks. And so there is an element where structure and having pillars and, and bringing it back to my values always is very, very important. That was actually going to be my next question. How often do you or do you revisit the values that you bring into your business? And how often do you revisit or set time aside to get really conscious about the messaging that you're sharing? Because that ADHD Manny Gen piece is such a cre such a source of creativity can be such a source of fire, such a source of, of beauty and complexity. I'd be curious to know, is there, do you have a practice of sitting with your business and observing your values and whether you're embodying those as the spokesperson for your brand? How do you, how do you relate to that and how much of it is conscious and practiced? So the value filter, which I now call your compass, is mm -hmm. at the center of my business. And that is where we, first of all, find three words that represent your uh, values and, and, and create this kind of filter throughout to view the world and make decisions and, and know which be really concise in, in how you are expressing yourself that then developed into five and that is a practice that I use every day in every single thing that I do in my business in how I show up in relationships in absolutely everything and it, and it is the, at the 
core of everything I do are these value words, but but more than that, they're energies and there's a quality to them that infuses through everything. Over the years, the names for those words or for those qualities has evolved and shifted and changed. For example, what I call my static masculine, which is that earth or that grounded energy that's connected to my identity and connected to my gut brain, used to be duty. But it's... Um, but it's actually truth. It's why I have true written on my hand. And it is, you know, I'm re- it goes back to that, that advocacy that I was talking about. But the quality of true north mm-hmm. versus duty is very, very different in, t- um, in terms of semantics. But the yeah. energy underneath it is, is the same. And so the quality of the values has remained and, and, and are me in essence. But the words that I've used to describe them has shifted over the years. But it's something that I'm very 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 mindful of and I come back to all the time as as is they're kind of three areas of my business which is know yourself trust yourself express yourself or empowerment embodiment full self-expression but kind of having those pillars and having those uh, qualities and foundations and structures I find to be incredibly supportive and one of the things that I teach is that we need like structure breeds freedom you cannot have that freedom without some kind of structure or containment yeah because otherwise butterflies and distraction and you never never really know where you're headed I know it well it's a practice that <laughs> in the life of a an ADHD driven Manny Jen is all too easy to to fall into. So one of the things that I say every time I teach my my loud and clear program, which is my my brand voice and messaging um, strategy program for my clients, one of the things I say all the time is you are not your brand. Mm-hmm. And it's a little controversial because some people will say, well, of course you're a personal brand. You're the face of the brand. It's your mm-hmm. work. Of course you are. My take on that is if I buy into your community, if I support your Patreon to hear the after hours of your beautiful podcast, if I decide to work with you one-to-one in your incredible experiences that you offer in Spain, which is highly tempting, I don't walk away from that with your pinky finger. Like you don't Mm -hmm. end up with the word trut on your tattooed on your hand because I've taken the H away. (laughs) Like you don't, (laughs) I don't get part of you, right? So what I say to my clients is you are not your brand. You may be a baker, but people, when they leave, they take your cake. They don't take your hair. So there is, the reason that I share that is because for many people, when, especially when in the beginning, or when you've built something with your blood, sweat, and tears over time, and you care so deeply about it, it's entwined with your very insides. Mm -hmm. Creating messaging, doing the marketing, showing up, whatever that means in the context of your business, can feel so unsafe and so triggering and so emotionally laden that to say you're not your brand, just gives that little bit of space because yes, you bring the values that are true for you. And, you know, you've said the semantics may be different between duty and I've, my brain has just lost the, the new word. Truth. Truth. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks brain. Um, the semantics may be different, but what's underlying it is, is the mm-hmm. same. You, you bring parts of yourself to the expression of your values and some of your values into your business, but you don't bring other private secret parts of you that are yours to cherish and, and explore and, and maybe share with someone in an, in an intimate relationship. You don't bring those into your business because there is, as you said, there's, I can see this, these five, this pentagon of, of, of you know, holding this container around you, the parts of you that you bring to the business. And then beyond that is ever expanding who you are as a person. Where do you stand on this idea of you are not your brand? So I, I also share this and with my people when they're going through the fundamentals. And I think it's really, really important. And I love how you shared it. And for me, it's the sim, it's the it's the same as saying to someone you are bad versus your behavior is not great. Mm. And the difference and like the differentiation between this is how I 
present my stuff in the world. This is behavior. This is what I do. This is how I show, you know, this is what I give to the world. And this is me is really, really important. Because if you don't have that separation, if someone doesn't pay an invoice, it's personal. Mm -hmm. If, you know, and so those separations, and for me, one of the ways of doing that was creating policy. How does this company respond to X? What does this company do when Y happens, right? And getting really clear again on some rules because, you know, love the rules. <laughs> if I know them, mm -hmm. the, yes. the rules us are contractual. They are here to protect us both. They're here to give us clarity. They give us all sorts of safety that mm -hmm. if we don't have them, we don't have, right? And so many of us are really, really against picking just one thing or creating containment or having a contract or mm -hmm. you know not being nice and not being kind and what happens is we're being overly responsible for other people and not responsible enough for ourselves and so there has to be a separation and like unpicking you from your business or from your personal brand is something that I, I have also seen is very sticky and very difficult for people to do and so I think coming up with things like a bio or a tagline or you know what do you do and I can now say it wrote right like I've said it so many times in my life that it it becomes rather than like this kind of shock when people say what does the business do or what do you do in that way it's I can say I help people create lives that are as extraordinary and unique as they are, that feel as good on the inside as they perhaps look on the outside. And that took a long time. And I actually had to stand in front of the minute mirror at the beginning and say it over and over and over again so that I had clarity. And in that messy middle bit that you were speaking about, everything smushed and I was definitely in a cocoon and I didn't know what was me and what was the business anymore. Mm -hmm. And what I found recently is that having those really strong values and having that tagline and having that description has been incredible because I've suddenly started using them again yeah. <laughs> I'm recycling posts from the last eight years every single day I go into memories on Facebook and I pull something out and I'm like yes that's still true because and again I may change the language on it ever so slightly and make it relevant for myself and for my people today mm -hmm. but because the value is still there because the essence of the message is still there it makes it so much easier to run my business because I don't have to give of myself. But I also had to deal with the part of me that thought that was cheating, right? Recycling content, not creating something new every single day. Um, yeah, and, and part of that journey for me has also been not creating, not ever finishing a product suite, like iterating and making it better and never quite thinking it was good enough over yeah. and over and over again. 10 years in, like literally this week, I have finalized my product <laughs> Woohoo! That's a huge win. It is. And someone said to me the other day, of course you're going to make new things. That's not true. And I was like, no, what I've done is I've created a product suite that allows me to, some of them will always be the same. Mm -hmm. And some like the art, I get to make new things within that container. Yeah. And, you know, and, and some of the offers I get to do live with people. So they will be completely different every time. And some will be self study. And then I can come in and answer questions. And Finding the time to find the format of your business for your brand that works for you and for the client, mm -hmm. that took me a really long time, but it's, I think it's really worth doing. Yeah. It sounds like, I completely agree, and it sounds like you have come to a place now in, in this phase of your evolution, because it keeps going, <laughs> yes. obviously, but the, it sounds like the place that you're at in your evolution is that you have found the balance within yourself you've I was just listening to your to your podcast with um Tamu Thomas and talking about the importance that, that you know the play would come after after you've done all the things that you should do and in fact yeah. that you were hitting that ceiling of I'm growing but I'm not growing enough and it's just like and it, that really resonated with her and as I was listening with me and I'm sure with with everyone who's listening and to to realize that to have have the structure, which then gives you the freedom, right? And I've heard this so many times and every time I will, I will fess up every time I read or see structure gives freedom. I go, <laughs> my eyes roll back in my head and I'm like, I don't want to do that. This little very young part of me doesn't, you know, we're stuck at about 11 years of age and we're 
giving the finger to the other parts that are like, maybe we should get some structure in here because then we can have some freedom. It sounds like you have found that that equilibrium for yourself. And also you met, you kind of alluded to this, but didn't say it. Finding the structure and the format of your business that works for your brand and your people, but also for your brain, right? So, 100%. Yes. So it sounds like you're at a place now where your brand is titrated such that your brain and body and embodiment and spirit get peak delight and fun and the amount of variety you need within a structure, the brand is cohesive enough and has been consistent enough, even over the 10 years of this chrysalis to butterfly to chrysalis to butterfly sequence, that you can then find the right people and embody for them what it is that you can, what you can guide them to. It sounds simultaneously uh, contained and limitless. Does that feel fair? 100% and here's the deal when I was trying to operate under the patriarchal societal format of a seven day week with a 24 hour day with an eight hour work window it did not work for me and it led me to believe that I was inconsistent when I started tracking my cycle and working with a 28 and a half or 29 day cycle, I'm really tracking that data and then looking at the numbers in my business and like the places where I was super productive and the places where I needed to rest. Turns out I'm totally consistent. I am 100% consistent, but the, the lens I was looking with was too tight. And as I have widened it, and it's the same thing, right? Three word brand, three three offers, one offer, whatever. It wasn't the right size for me. Mm-hmm. Now, if I look at that across my whole life, I was still trying to fit into clothes that were too small. Like I have spent my whole life trying to be smaller because I am too much. Now in human design terms, I have defined ego and I have a, uh, a family member who has who has an undefined ego and two actually and that meant that it always it, I was too much right like me being I am this look, like I can do this this is really easy for me was too much for them and so I learned that I was too much mm-hmm. so I've spent so much of my life trying to be smaller and so in terms of titration Like, absolutely, what I've done is made the business model bigger. I've learned to size up on jeans and not feel awful because I'm in a size two. Like, I've come, does it fit? (laughs) Not what's the size? And changing those questions and allowing myself to be at the center of my business without it being me has changed everything for me. That sounds like a wonderful place for us to close this conversation, I would love for you to share with people where they can find you if they would like to get more curious about all things. We didn't touch on human design, but I'll put some links into your work because I'm sure they'll find some places in there. I know, in fact, that there are some places in there that you talk about that. You have a podcast episode with uh, Sherry Thompson, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So I'll link to that. So for anyone who's curious about human design and to learn all about the manifesting generator, or even to find your own, Find out what your own human I, design is. I will have a free report that will, it's not ready yet. And I'm again, you know, squirreling behind the scenes, trying to keep up with myself with all of the things and seeing how it all ties together right now. Um, but I will have a free report on how to create more time and more money using your human design. And so that is something I'm really, really passionate about. And I've been working out how to bring human design into my work without overcomplicating. It. so there will that will be available at some point um my website is ebonyellard.com where you can sign up for the mailing list and when i remember to email you on a monday or a thursday you will get an email and if you want to make sure that i haven't fallen off the face of the planet i am always on instagram in stories and that is the best place to find me and that is at ebony alchemy at ebony alchemy We will find you there. Thank you so much for being my guest today and for sharing about your evolution through all the different seasons over the last decade. And I look forward to seeing you shine online. Thank you so much. Bye for now.